Welcome to the Three Haunted Podcast, where we bring you all things horror, supernatural, folklore, mythology, and all things that go bump in the night. What's up, everybody? This is your co-host, Ashley Lunar Goddess, guerrilla girl filmmaker and horror-loving cinephile. I'm just your average podcast-producing badass. I'm John Thomas. Some would say that I go a little too far with my love of all things horror, paranormal, and meta, but I say... Talk nerdy to me, and I'm all yours. What's up, ghouls, gals, and all of our paranormal pals out there? In today's episode, we'll be bringing back special guest C.L. Thomas, author and fellow podcaster. Welcome back, C.L. Hi, it's always a pleasure to come talk to you guys. I am so happy to have you back. Uh, I follow all of your adventures that I can on social media. (laughs) (laughs) I follow you guys too all the time. (laughs) You have gone on some really amazing adventures. Uh, I I feel like not only do you go overseas, you go across the country, you also go in your backyard, (laughs) like, you know, figuratively speaking. And I I absolutely love your sense of adventure. (laughs) Thank you. Well, my work, um, so I do a lot of public relations and I have to travel a lot. So I've been on tour for the last four months. Um, We're in our off time now, but I hit the road again in February and it's pretty packed all the way up until April. So I'm traveling all over the country this year. That's so exciting. I love it. It's so much fun. Now in your travels this year, where was your probably most I don't want to say favorite but yeah let's go with that where was your favorite place to travel this year oh that's hard I I did so many bucket list things this year so my number one is probably Prague um that was that's been a bucket list item for me forever I've always wanted to go see Prague and and I didn't get a chance to do a lot of artwork like I would like you know, I paint and I do a lot of photography. Um, and it's one of those cities that it's like New Orleans, you know, it's just what you do when you go there. And because I was with a tour group, we just didn't have the time, but I definitely plan on going back. And also there was a castle there, um, maybe about 45 minutes outside of Prague called Huska Castle. Mm -hmm. And I just had some amazing experiences there with the paranormal world. Um, in the States, my bucket list item was probably Oregon because I've always wanted to see the Redwoods and Joshua Tree Forest. But both of those were bucket list items that I got to check off. So pretty exciting. I remember you hinted at the Joshua Tree Forest. And I, I think <laughs> I was one of the first to comment, where are you? Where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's weird because um, I, I know Phil Kaufman personally from Nashville and you know, he used to tell these, these stories and I would think he was like just a crazy, crazy old guy, right. That would hang out at the coffee house or at the Brown's diner. That's where he used to hang out. And I don't know, it turned out it was true. And he would, I would ask him about it and he would say, well, you just got to go. So I just always wanted to go. And I finally got a chance to stay in Graham Parsons room and I investigated the hotel and it was pretty neat. What did you experience during your investigation? So definitely not demons. I know that a lot of groups on television go there and they claim to be possessed and this and that. Definitely not that. It's actually a very peaceful environment. Uh, It is very haunted. Um, There's a female spirit in there. There is a male spirit. I've gotten a lot of EVPs, probably over 50 EVPs from this place. It's amazing. Oh, wow. I felt a like a shadow figure behind me um just a lot has happened in the few days that I stayed there it's an amazing place but it's definitely not the demonic you're not going to go there and get possessed or any of that kind of stuff I don't know I might no (laughs) (laughs) they keep telling me what you vibrate out you bring it in I feel like I still get scared so (laughs) Maybe that, you know, that could be true because I'm trying to figure out, well, why are these guys getting possessed every time they go to these places? And then I go in there and have a completely different experience. You know, it's just not as just like, I don't know. 
But as far as Joshua Tree Forest, it's it has that very light vibe, like um, very clean energy, um, very artistic. I mean, if you want to write or anything, that's the place to go. It's it's just got those vibes. Yeah, we've heard a lot of extraterrestrial experiences happen in Joshua yeah, Tree. Yeah, that too. And I mm-hmm. feel like just the photos, just the energy of the photos that come from there, I'm just like, yeah, if extraterrestrial is going to happen, it feels like the energy <laughs> is there. Let's go. Grant Parsons would go there and and he claimed to be in contact with aliens and stuff. And that's why he was so drawn to that place. It could be the result of all the drugs he was taking too at the time, but we won't mention that. (laughs) It only helps with the communication. Just a little bit, yeah. (laughs) Now, I know you were doing, you were with the tour group in Prague. What kind of experiences did you have there? Because it's so much older there. Like the history is just goes back even further. So I'm curious what you experienced there. Um, Prague, you know, I didn't really experience anything paranormal in Prague, but in the castle, Huska Castle, I did. So Prague is, um, I was more focused on looking at the art and the architecture and I, I just wasn't focusing so much on the paranormal, but Huska Castle, we went there to investigate one night and, uh, for those who aren't familiar with it. It's a castle that I'm not sure when it was built. It was 11th century um, when the actual foundation was built. That's what they were able to trace. And this castle was built by villagers. Um, I wish I had a photo I could show you, but it's like way out in the middle of nowhere, up high up on this cliff. So really remote, really hard to get to. And the village was down below. And so they built this castle because they believed that there was demonic entities coming out of a well there and that that was what was making the town sick. And so they built the castle to keep the demon in, to appease them and keep them in. So it's the only castle in the world built to keep stuff in rather than keeping stuff out. So when we went there, um, they had this basement, of course, uh, and it's dedicated to, you know, the demons and all this kind of stuff. Um, On the walls, there's like, really old, centuries old, um, grotesques all over the walls of demonic faces and stuff. And they keep like this stuffed demon sitting on like a throne in there, of course. And then they have this huge upside down cross made out of wrought iron. This thing is huge. It's got to be over a hundred pounds or more. And it hangs in the middle of this, of the ceiling. Well, when we were investigating there, um, it started swaying back and forth on its own. And I'm not talking just a little bit. This thing was really going. I mean, you would have to have some kind of physical force to make it rock like like it was. Um, the other thing we did was we felt a lot of audible sounds and things like that. A couple rooms up, another group of investigators were doing table tipping. And the table was like spinning in circles. It was it was crazy. I just never seen that strong of activity physically like that that w- could be experienced by so many different people. Do you think having all of that like demonic like paraphernalia in there? Because I wonder <laughs> everything on the walls and the upside down cross is that to keep the demon drawn in because it's surrounded by all of that. I think so. They were trying to appease this thing to keep it in, first of all. Um, There is like a chapel in there that has all of these symbolic things. Like, I think it's uh, Archangel Michael, maybe, slaying the dragon and those kinds of imagery from, and these are centuries old drawings that are on the walls. Um, So originally, you know, they were trying to use Christianity and their religious beliefs to keep whatever it was in there. I think nowadays the present owner, however, I think because there's like modern day satanic photos and everything all over the walls, I think they're probably dabbling in that kind of stuff or mm-hmm. or maybe they're mimicking kind of like um, Zach Bagan's museum. You go into their basement and they have that fake um, um, 
pentagram on the on the walls and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know if it's a gimmick or if it's like they're actually doing stuff in there to keep it going. There's probably groups that go in there to to purposely do that sort of thing. Uh, there's just no telling. I feel it's like the chicken or the egg. Like they're yeah. <laughs> they're kind of. <laughs> If there wasn't a demon there before, there's one there now. <laughs> so that's interesting. Yeah, I looked it up and I see online they said that a church, a chapel was built directly over the castle pit and it's dedicated to the Archangel Michael. So that's interesting. You have like the yin and the yang, the Demonic symbols on the walls and my <laughs> Archangel Michael in the center. <laughs> yeah, of course, all all the all the big guys, right? Yeah. They're just having it out there. I'm looking at the pictures of it online, and that definitely looks like a really neat place. It the story of it reminds me a lot of the nun, like the the demon that is kept inside of the abbey, and what it was built over. And so that's really interesting, the idea that it was bombed and it somehow opened up, reopened up that portal to hell that the demon can come through. So that it reminded me a lot of that. I'm <laughs> kind of wondering, though, is the nun inspired by this? It, it could be. It very well could be. Because that is the exact story of Huska Castle. I mean, it's literally built and the chapel really is over this um, old whale that they thought that these demonic things were coming out of. I think they even touched on in the nun, uh, the influence of the war and looking up this castle, it says during world war two, the Nazis took an interest in the castle and it was partially occupied and locals reported seeing unexplained lights emanating from the castle at night. So Mm. Mm, that's very true. Um, one of the things about the castle that I didn't know is that um, one of the things I picked up on was a Nazi soldier yelling at a, a woman. And I kept trying to figure out, well, why would a Nazi be in here, right? And so another friend of mine who is a psychic medium, she started doing a little bit of research. And she actually pulled up that the Nazis did take over this castle when they were invading Prague. They they took over this castle and the reason being they moved a whole lot of occult books and stuff into it and was dabbling with the dark arts to try to win the war. So there's a whole lot more to Huska Castle than <laughs> than what's being told. It seems like there there's something about this territory, this land that really draws them in. Maybe there is something around the well because it said in the 1630s, the castle was believed to be occupied by a Swedish black magic practitioner named Oronto. He was trying to find eternal life there using the occult. And the uh, locals were so scared of him that two hunters broke into the castle and murdered him. So... Oh, I've never even heard of that story. (laughs) You have a lot dating back. (laughs) Around this, I just keep hitting my mic. You have a lot dating back around this castle. And so it's like, what's going on with the grounds that it keeps drawing in this kind of stuff? And, you know, they don't really know exactly when this castle was built. You know, they just, they were able to radiocarbon some of the structures and they dated that as far back as 11th century. But they think the well part is a lot older. So, I mean, there's no telling. There's no telling. I think when you're looking at something that old that has drawn so many centuries of energy like that, I mean, that just opens all kinds of doorways and gateways. It's funny, the folklore and that surrounds it. They say that it's a bottomless pit and locals swear that winged beasts emerge from it. So According to legends, a local duke wanted to dispel it, went to hell. And so he (laughs) sent a young prisoner down into the hole. And this is where, you know, folklore comes into play because it's kind of comedic in the fact that they said that the descent was longer than anyone imagined. So much that when they pulled him up, he had aged 40 years. (laughs) He was so disturbed by what he had witnessed, he was committed to an asylum. So um, 
According to legend, the Duke took action and it was to build the castle directly atop the pit and block the entrance to whatever lay beneath. Wow, that is so interesting. (laughs) (laughs) I love lore. So it's kind of, it's interesting to read stuff like that because I, just like with any other kind of like uh, lore and urban legends, there is some truth built into there. So you kind of wonder what part of that is true. There's always something that that came out of a legend or a story like that that's been around for centuries. But what's interesting that about Huska is that it appears to be the only castle that wasn't used in some kind of war defense. Instead, it was built to keep stuff in. I mean, right there is is you know something darker is going on with the grounds. Um, I can tell you this: I have dreams about that place still. So it does have a hold of me, and I definitely want to go back to that place and and spend a couple nights there. So, can you stay there? Yeah, you can. Yeah. So CL is going to go to Huska Castle and come back. Not CL. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back as something else. That's I'm going to find <laughs> eternal life and. You're going to come back and you'll, you'll be like, my name is Orondo. And I'm like, oh, no, we know who it is. <laughs> Who's that girl from um, Game of Thrones where she emerges out of the fire at, at the end of just about every episode? <laughs> the blonde haired girl? That's going to be me. I'm is it Khaleesi? <laughs> the dragon always yeah. naked. I, I, I didn't understand that. She's always rising naked out of like. A power burnt rubble. <laughs> Every single episode. <laughs> they were just trying to appease specific. I, say, I think I got to start watching the this show more. Yeah. <laughs> John Thomas. Uh, well, I've, I've watched like the first three episodes over and over again because I got bored and forgot about it. And like, that's about as far as I've gotten. So, yeah. <laughs> Not very far. <laughs> As you were approaching Huska Castle, like from your original destination in Prague, was there a specific boundary where you could feel it shift, like the energy? Yeah, so it's down this little road, a little narrow road, and it goes through like this wooded area. And of course, we're in a tour bus. So the bus driver had a little bit of a hard time getting this bus down there. and And finally, he parks it and he goes, I can't go any further. So we had to walk the rest of the way. And I forget how long it was. It wasn't too long, maybe about a mile or so. And um, as soon as we stepped off the bus, I started feeling it. And so did some other people. And I actually heard an audible growl from the side of the woods when we got off the bus. So, yeah, this place, it, it's a grounds thing. It's not just the castle. It's, it's the entire area. And it's very remote. There's really not a lot around it. You're very brave. I feel like if I stepped off the bus and felt the energy shift and I heard a growl, I'd go back on the bus and be like, well, I'll see you guys in eight hours. Have a good time. (laughs) I can see that. I can see that. Did your equipment work like while you were on the ground? I didn't take anything with me. Okay. I didn't take anything. I didn't have any equipment. I know some other people did. Um, They were the ones who... And we actually, they filmed the table tipping thing where that table was spinning. Um, they, I think, have a whole lot of stuff on film. Now, we do have that that cross thing. We have that on film that was started swaying. My friend started filming that, but I didn't have anything with me. I tend to not take a lot of stuff like that. If I do, it's usually just an EVP thing and maybe like a little cat ball or something like that. But I tend not to really use a lot of that equipment. Have you rewatched the film of the swaying? No. Oh, yes. I thought you were referring to something else. Um, I have. I did watch it again. Did you feel anything from that? Like after the fact? Yeah, it's... Like I said, it, it's really got a hold of me somehow. Like, I have dreams about this place. It's like drawing me in, whatever it is, to either uncover it or something. I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. 
when you say that you have dreams about it, what kind of dreams? Like you're there or it's – I'm always curious because I dream about places too that have left like an imprint because of like a metaphysical attachment. And so I'm always kind of curious when other people have dreams about places like what they experience. So I dream about the woods around it. it it's surrounded by these really thick, dark forests. I always see that at nighttime. Um, and then I see the courtyard. There's a courtyard right in the middle of it. And there's like this thing in the middle. And I think it used to be like a water fountain or something. But um, when I see it, it's like the floor is fresh. Like it's not broken up. It's actually like new. There's like actual painting and stuff on the on the flooring. And that fountain is actually working. So, yeah, that's that's what I see. So are you potentially connecting to it in a previous state? Maybe. So it's previous time, I guess, previous point in time. There we go. <laughs> I'd never see the basement in my dreams or any of that, but I do see um, there is a room that I normally see in the dream, and it it just has a chair in it. There's nothing else in it. So I don't know. It's very strange. That's interesting. I've dreamt, there was one building I dreamt of years ago and it was connected to one of our guests. So I had actually never even been there. And he was going there with his brothers to do some kind of, you know, basic investigation stuff. And that same night I had a dream. I was in this location and they were there and it just didn't feel quite like a dream. So when I woke up, I messaged him to ask about it. But the place that I described, he's like, well, that's not where we were. And he sent me pictures later that day and said, is this what you saw? And I looked at the pictures and I was like, that's it. Where'd you find that? And apparently (laughs) the place that I dreamt of was the place they were at. But, uh, a long time ago prior to it having been renovated because I guess it had partially burned and they renovated it and completely modernized it. And so I dreamt of it prior to all of that. And I'm like, how, how could I do that? Well, that's pretty neat. So you're like picking up somebody else's energy and kind of doing like a remote viewing kind of thing. I guess I, I, I don't know how often this happened because I don't typically reach out to people about that. But for that specific one, I I felt like, you know what? I could reach out to this person and ask a weird question. (laughs) Um, It it was interesting because in the dream, I was kind of following them. I wasn't really interacting with them, but following them. And they were trying to get into this ballroom and they had to go out to these windows to try and go in. So I told them about that. I was like, that's so weird. Like, were you guys stuck somewhere? And he said they knew there was supposed to be another room that night. They were trying to find the entrance to it and they couldn't find the entrance to this supposed secret room. And I was like, did you go outside? (laughs) Did you try and go outside through the window? And he's like, no, that would have been a good idea. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's really interesting. That means though, that you, you you would have abilities and a lot of mediums, they, they do remote viewing to try to develop their mediumship. It's, It's a common thing. Well, when you go to Huska Castle, we'll link up. No, I'm kidding. Don't draw me there. Remember, I stay on the bus. Uh, (laughs) You know, it's interesting you mention all of the uh, demonic symbols and the things they're doing to maybe appease the demon because I went to this abandoned warehouse in Utah and it was a funky place, but very similar on the walls and the cement and the floors and everything people had written all sorts of imagery and sigils and stuff that I'm like, why would they like, are they just trying to draw something in? And then in the basement, there was at the base of the steps, there was a sign that they wrote uh, this way to 
heaven, this way to hell. And so I was like, is this reverse psychology? So (laughs) I'm like, I'm going to go both ways at some point. So I went left and it, it was weird. And I don't know why they had this built like the original building owners, but it was a completely circular room in the basement. Yeah. And that's not typical for buildings. And it was a cement room. So it's just a cement circular room. And it feels like if you gave somebody markers who has completely lost their mind or is in full possession, got a hold of the walls, like it would do, you almost couldn't see the cement because they had just like gone all over the walls. Oh, wow. Yeah. And standing in the center of the room and looking around, it's like, so I feel like I'm surrounded by madness, by chaos, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it wasn't just writing. Like it was occult symbolism. It was occult imagery and occult statements. And I was like, Oh, this is not heaven. And so <laughs> I went the other way. When you're, when people, even when you're drawing a protective circle around yourself, just think about that. You always, they're always mimicking circles because there's no beginning and there's no end. So that tower shaped, there's so much symbolism in the tower in itself. There's like defense, there's all kinds of stuff. I don't know. Yeah. So, No, that makes a good point. Every castle has a tower to it. Most most occult places that were built over in Europe, uh, there's a house in Romania that we went to. And the story is, I forget the name of this um, mansion. It's not really a mansion. It's just a big house. But in the center of it, there's a tower. And it was built purposely that way. And the guy was dabbling with spiritualism his daughter died of tuberculosis and they were just devastated and they were trying to connect with their daughter. And so they built this house specifically to do that. And in the center where they would do all the communications, it is, it's a tower and the top of it is open. So there is like a glass ceiling and the whole thing is is constructed to um, communicate with spirit so there, there's something to be said about the symbolism in towers with the occult that goes way back. Yeah, no, that's completely true. That makes sense that maybe this room was being utilized as a ritual space. Mm-hmm. And because of its inherently built-in circle, and it's at the ba- in the basement, so you don't have to worry about like breaks in the circle because um, mm-hmm. it's the furthest within the earth (laughs) that you can get you're you're literally grounded um (laughs) (laughs) but the yeah the the symbolism and like everything on it was just just layered on so I don't know how long this place had been used but it was interesting because listening to what you said about the Huska castle I wonder with all of the imagery that was outside of the basement but in the upper levels what they were potentially trying to keep in because I felt the presence of at night we had kind of driven by and I felt like a woman was beckoning from the highest point. There was like this overlook that used to have a door. I don't know where the door led to because it's not there. There's nothing outside of it anymore, but there was a door and I swear I could feel her and I could almost hear her singing. And it's like, what is this? (laughs) What is this place? Hmm. that's interesting Uh, yeah I I haven't heard of that one but I do know it is kind of weird that to your point that people will go into these places and just keep that demonic presence going or try to build upon it I see that so much particularly in the paranormal world and I just don't understand what the draw to it is you know it's just weird I don't know why you would want to mess with that kind of entities and things. I don't know if it's just a thrill thing. Are you really trying to gain power? I mean, why wouldn't you use Archangel Michael, who is known to um, overcome the dark energy? So obviously he's a lot stronger. I don't understand why you wouldn't go with that power instead. You know, it just there's so many things that doesn't make sense to me about it. I think there's a like versus like, right? Or like attracting like, like we just, 
kind of mentioned about going into a place, vibrating out energy, and so kind of calling it back. But I think maybe it works in reverse as well. So if these lands or areas carry something, maybe it's something that's much older, that's existed there longer than us, and vibrates out that energy, maybe that does call to people that are on that same energy level at that point in time, which makes me wonder, why did I hear that lady singing? Maybe, (laughs) maybe (laughs) that's the state I was in at that point in time, but it's possible. Um, We all go through moments of vibrating low, whether we like it or not. And it's possible, but I do wonder if there are things that exist people I've heard people refer to it as like ancient ones and maybe there are things that exist prior to us that have been here much longer than us that kind of vibrate out into that earth and Mm -hmm. so it just naturally kind of beacons in those that are on that level and they keep it going because that's what that space is I don't know (laughs) There could be some, I mean, this stuff like this goes back in, in every single culture. There's, there's an agent one in every culture and they all have their own way of communicating to whatever that agent one is. You look at the Native Americans and something like Chaco Canyon. That's another sacred little thing there. Um, I forget what those are called. It ends with a K. Um, but they build these round circles. If, if you look up Chaco Canyon, that whole place is, they think, is built specifically for spirit communication as well as like some other things. But it's mainly ritual work. Why did they do that? Um, why did they, oh, kivas, they're called kivas. Why would they build these kivas to do all of their ritualistic work? Again, you're looking at the tower symbol. Um, and then there's another one with like pyramids. You see that in every single culture. You see that in Tibet. You see that in China. You see that in... Um, with the natives of South America, you see it with the Mayans, um, you see it in Egypt. I mean, that's a structure that's over and over again as well, all across the world. And they're trying to, and most of those are used in some kind of ritualistic work. So, I mean, we even see that in modern day stuff with the Masons, the pyramid structure. Yeah, the pyramid structures, I think, do speak to that sacred triangle, you know, shape that we oftentimes talk about. And then I almost feel like they're just portions of the, what is it called? Uh, Oh, gosh. It's like we've all got portions of it and they come together to create that one sacred shape. And it's apparently not wanting to come out of my head or my mouth at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it's like right there on the tip of my tongue and I'm like, Ugh. we've said it so many times before. Merkaba. Merkaba. Yeah, that's it. There we go. It, it, I had to fight it for a moment. but So, <laughs> <laughs> so the Merkaba, which is just like a lot of those triangular shapes around that source energy. And so I kind of wonder if pyramids are kind of pieces of that. And I don't know, this is where the drugs come into play. No, I'm joking. joking. (laughs) (laughs) I think you're onto something because even if you look at the pentagram, if you break it down into symbols, you have one, two, three, four, you got five triangles around a circle. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of incorporating all of it. So it's just interesting. Which is like the Merkaba too, which is the the triangles that go around and then you've got the central circular kind of within the center. And Mm -hmm. it could be like a whole lecture. (laughs) I think we've all got pieces of it, right? We feel it intuitively. And so that's where we see the pyramids and the circles, the kivas and towers and all of these things, these sacred circles and these sacred triangles and maybe what we're missing is they all have to go together. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think that's where the collective spirituality and collective thought come into play. I think, you know, you have, when you go into an area such as Huska's castle, you have layers and layers and layers of different people bringing their energy in there and calling up energy. It becomes kind of like a collective spiritual thing, doesn't it? 
And then when you look at it at a larger scale, like even in a nation, you look at something like America, we have all this political stuff going on right now and rhetoric and all this stuff between A versus B and, you know, that collective energy, that struggle, it shows. It shows in our economy. It just trickles down into everything. So I think it becomes more of like a collective thing after a while. That makes sense. (laughs) We're just kind of like, hmm. (laughs) It's like there's all these pieces moving around. (laughs) Right. Even, Even with the spiral, like we think about the spiral shapes that incorporates the elements of the triangle and the circle and people are drawn to the spiral and... Um, you were talking about the Chaco Canyon with the circles. There is the Sibley Volcanic National Park in Northern California, and it has spirals, endless spirals. You can find some have been overgrown. Some have, as you mentioned, people get drawn to. So over time, people have been building up the spirals that were there for who knows how long. You can see the original rocks there, but people have added to it and continue to build out the spirals and each one has its own energy and that place when you drive up to it you can feel it and similar to places that have this very enigmatic energetic fields where we talk about like vortex and vortices vortexes (laughs) And, and portals I have to imagine that also applies to places that are leaning towards the lower vibrations. You know, we've got different pockets and maybe some of the vortex. Is it vortexes or vortices? I don't know. I think we do both. (laughs) Vortices, I think, sounds right. I think it depends on where you are. (laughs) Well, so Mm -hmm. I, I do think that a vortex is a vortex and the vibration of it depends on what's been funneled into it. And so maybe Huska Castle is a negative leaning or lower vibration leaning vortex and then you know you go somewhere to like Sedona and the whole darn place is like a positive vortex so (laughs) I I I do wonder I think it's on one of those ley lines isn't it it sure is what they always talk about yeah and that's an interesting place because Driving oh, in from Phoenix up to Sedona, you just feel it. Kind of like you felt with Huska, like that moment where it shifts. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> this is where we're yeah, going. <laughs> that, that was... I haven't been, I haven't been to Sedona. Um, I have been asked to, to go out there, but I haven't had a chance to get out there yet. But I know there's a lot of healing retreats and meditational retreats and things like that in that area. A lot of the medium crowd from Lilydale and the spiritualist church uh, go there for, for conventions and things like that. I think just visiting is healing. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I'll absolutely. be honest. I think the longer you stay there, just it's healing. Although we read when we went that the state and vibration that you enter in to Sedona with is magnified. So they recommend people try and ground themselves and be at a kind of higher vibration when you go in just because it does magnify. And so if you're feeling very low, it may not feel so good. But I don't know because I feel like if the energy is high and the vibration is high, you can probably redirect and utilize that to help lift your vibration. It's interesting. I just love the idea of groups of people getting together to raise their vibration. I mean, literally, it's this, and this is sounds so biblical, and I don't mean it to be from a Christian biblical standpoint, but it does say when two or more numbers come together to pray that mountains can be moved. Um, there's something to be said about that. Look at it from outside of the dogma and rhetoric of the church and look at it from a metaphysical standpoint of what they're saying. And then compare it to something like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, the Wiccan guy, who was the guy who created Wicca? I forget his name. His name escapes me right now. Gerald Gardner? That's it. Gerald Gardner. Um, he did an experiment when he, you know, he, he started the whole Wiccan movement back in, I think, the 30s. And uh, he lived in England. 
And he had a whole group of people. They would get together, they would meditate, they would do ritualistic work, all kinds of stuff. And when England was being invaded by Germany, he had this idea that if he had enough people to collectively get together and start meditating and raise the vibration, they could stop Germany from invading England. And that's what they did. They, all, I think, I don't know how many people gathered that day, but they were all from like, uh, meditational backgrounds and, and witches and things like that. They got together, they stood on the beach and they started meditating that night. You cannot cross the sea. You cannot cross the sea. And they were kind of just like envisioning a barrier to where to stop the, the Germans from coming over. And it actually worked. Germany was not able to invade England at that time. Now, I don't know if it, you know, if it was an actual because of these guys praying or not, but there's, there's something to be said about that. It is kind of ironic that something stopped Germany from invading England at that time. So ideas like that, when you have so many people that get together and, and collectively try to have a positive outcome on anything, I feel like it's very possible. And I wish, you know, more people would wake up to that idea. Yeah, even if you take the metaphysical out of it, anytime you get a collective together focused on one mission, change can happen. And, right. you know, for me, I add layers onto that because I'm like, well, if you've got energy and everybody's got their energy focused on the same thing, they're manifesting. But you could mm-hmm. strip that back and just say, hey, you know what? Masses can make things happen. Masses can make a change and a mass can be as much as two people or more. And Mm -hmm. it's just that dedication and focus and determination. Now for me, I add the energy layer, but (laughs) that's just me being (laughs) woo woo. (laughs) It's still, I love to woo woo, but you know, it it also works, I think too, in your personal life. If you're one of those that struggle with, um, you know, depression, or, or, or if you're one of those people that always have some kind of drama in your life, I really feel like if you just sat down and kind of changed your energy a little bit and worked on yourself, you could totally get out of that on your own. Yeah. No, I'm with you completely. Now, tell us about your new book, because last time we talked, <laughs> it hadn't come out yet, but now it's out. Woo! Dancing with Demons is, it's, it's a, almost an autobiography about a haunting that took place about maybe 15 years ago when I lived in Nashville. So it's about, I grew up in the paranormal, um, been having paranormal experiences since I was like two, three years old. But for me, it was a very different experience. Most mediums, they always talk about how negative it was, how scared they were, that sort of thing. That wasn't the case for me. Um, it was more of a comforting stuff that happened. And, you know, I kind of forgot about it in high school. Um, I was more focused on getting through school and getting education, starting careers, that kind of thing. And then when I moved to Nashville and was in medical, medical school at the time, I had a boyfriend. We moved into, we moved in together. We moved into this house and this house just changed my whole perspective of the paranormal, kind of turned it upside down. First of all, it it woke me up back into the spirituality and and paranormal. It just woken all that up in me again. And then the second thing was it totally destroyed my relationship. It destroyed me. I almost committed suicide over it. I walked away from the house with stage two cancer. So this, the haunting in this house was so negative that just so much that had happened in such a short time. I think I lived there for eight months. So, I mean, we're talking an eight months span, my whole life just like crashed. That's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Writing about these things because they are your experiences and they carry the energy of the trauma that you went through. Do you ever feel like it kind of reestablishes? any of those connections that you experienced during that time, or are you able to really just block it out? You know, I had a really hard time writing this book. I've been trying to put it out for two years, more like three years. And it seemed like every time I worked on this book, something bad would happen. I would get into a really bad car wreck. 
I've been through a tornado that pretty much took out everything. Um, just different things would happen like that, that would just totally stop me in my tracks. You know, COVID happened. So I felt like that wasn't a great time to put something like that out. Um, it was just thing after thing. I had a total meltdown with a relationship um, that I had and just different things happened. I was really depressed again. I haven't felt like that in years. That all came up. Um, a lot of struggles to get this book out. And I really do feel like that it could have been a lot of that dark energy again, pulling up because it didn't want me to maybe put it out for whatever reason. I did have somebody who was working with me on that book and I had to take him off the project because his family life started falling apart. So not only was it touching me, it was touching those around me. So I had to be real careful with who I got to work with me on this book. Now that it's out there, do you feel like there's some kind of healing or closure with that experience? There is. I feel like, you know, as as paranormal investigators, everyone knows that one person that comes up and no matter how much you try to help this person, they're always haunted. They're always, they always have a demon in their life. And then you look at their personal life and you start to see that there's all that drama is like almost self-caused. And that was the point of dancing with demons. Yes, there is negative entities and yes, they will attack you, that kind of thing. But in some sense, you really do have to take control of your own life and your own energy. And I, that was a very powerful lesson to me. And I feel like that book has really let me be able to kind of teach that to people who find themselves in that, that, in that rut where they think that a demon is attacking them all the time and they have all this drama they can't pull out of. Um, I really hope to start lecturing about the paranormal and kind of like my next book actually I'm writing is the spirit in paranormal and it's going to tie in all this stuff. And I really do hope that I can start lecturing and kind of teach people that, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. That's something I probably need to take lessons from. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this in my journey, I experience a lot less negative than I ever have before. Like growing up, I had a lot of the uh, lower vibrations kind of drawn into me and I wouldn't say demons, just, you know, cranky spirits <laughs> and, uh, and maybe some not so good entities, but for the most part, it was never positive. And over the past, well, since we started the podcast four or five years, I do feel like something has shifted within me, potentially because anything I do experience now isn't on those same levels of vibration. It's either neutral or dare I say positive. And I was like, wow, I didn't know that was possible for me. So, uh, having people out there like yourself who can speak to those topics and really help people develop a sense of empowerment so that they're not afraid is so fantastic. Cause I really do think that learning to, I don't want to say not be afraid, but learning to adjust the perspective. So we know that not everything paranormal is terrifying. Not everything spiritual is something to be afraid of. I think that's really, it's a powerful message. Thank you. Um, I think too, though, there, there's a little, there's a little bit more to that too. Um, like I wanted to make it clear that I do believe that stuff can happen to people with, with the paranormal world. Um, there is negative entities and that kind of thing. They can hurt you. And I feel like if you're not in the right place spiritually or, or mentally, and you're going out just looking for like a Friday night thrill with this stuff, I, I mean, you can really get hurt, you know? So that was like the other part of it. I really want to start teaching people that there's another way to do this. And, you know, it's like if somebody comes up to you and calls you, you know, some kind of bad name or something, you have a choice. You can either walk away being angry, 
You can walk away being sad. You can let it ruin your entire day. You still have that choice to decide. And a lot of people take the victim route where, oh, well, he called me this. So, you know, I feel like this and whatever. No, you kind of, you still have that choice on how you're going to walk away. Are you going to let someone ruin your whole day? I mean, that's still your choice, regardless of what you think about it. It's like that with paranormal too. You walk into a place and a lot of the activity, let's face it, it's, it's human activity. It's, it's those that passed on. Yeah, there is like demonic and there is like elementals, that sort of thing. But those are more rare most of the time in the places that these people are investigating, like Waverly Hills Sanatorium, for instance. <laughs> These are people that passed away, right? You go into a prison, these are human entities. So you still, no matter how negative that person is, you still have a choice to walk away either victimized, you can be strong about it. You know, I don't know. That's kind of just how I see it. Absolutely. You're responsible for your reaction. And whether it's a human or a spirit, if someone is being offensive towards you in some way, pulling your hair, smacking your butt, because we've heard apparently spirits could do that, then it's up to you to say, no, you're not allowed to do that. And if they keep it up, you can leave. You don't have to stay. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But you then you got these people that on television, they're getting possessed every five minutes. And but are they? Oh, man. <laughs> but are they? I don't know. Like Zach, I'm sorry. I love the guy sometimes, but... <laughs> And he's calmed down a lot um, since, you know, before. But, like, going in and treating these these spirits just badly, it's, you kind of get what you deserve. So if yeah. you're going to go in there with a bad attitude, come at me, bro, then they're going to come at you, and that's what you get. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> I, I think there's a danger in what's being presented, too, because if they're – let's say they're faking it, and it's just for entertainment value or purposes – that Even kind worse. of sends the message out that you too can easily be possessed. It's you mm-hmm. too. Yeah. You don't have the power to resist because exactly. it happens so easily. And it's like, no, 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 no. Right. <laughs> don't put that yeah. out there. <laughs> no. You have the choice of what energy you draw in. I hear that so much. Well, I'm afraid to go there because I might just draw all the negative en- energy and then I'll be affected for months. And, and I'm just like, no, that's not how that works. You choose to draw that in like that. So I don't know. It, it has taken me years to be able to say that it has, it's been a lifelong journey. And cause I was that person where I thought that um, a negative entity was following me. I thought I was being attacked, that kind of thing. And I was, but that's my choice, right? I can still rise up out of that situation where instead of being a victim. And I think that's the, that's the part that people, you know, the entertainment world, that's what they're not portraying. They're portraying that if you go, okay, for instance, over Thanksgiving, I investigate, or not Thanksgiving, just two weeks ago, I investigated the Goldfield Hotel with a friend of mine. And Honestly, there was not a lot of activity in there. I mean, it's very subtle. It was very human. It was not demonic as portrayed. I did not get possessed when I went in there. Um, I did contact the male that is said to be in there. Um, he doesn't possess people like I saw on television. Um, <laughs> the whole nine yards. So that same week I get home and the, one of the guys I went with, he goes, hey, watch this. So I looked at this film and it was this little group um, on YouTube. They have a little YouTube channel. They, they must have just went in there the same week that we went in there. And of course, the girls all demonically, depre- um, uh, you know, oppressed and this and that. They're in there possessed. And I'm just thinking, OK, guys, that's totally not the energy at Goldfield Hotel. None. <laughs> but I mean, that's the idea that the entertainment world is portraying and it's. A, it's dangerous. B, I just don't see the point of it. You know, you could be te- you can be using this stuff to teach people to better themselves and take control of their lives, that kind of thing. But instead, we're going to do it this way. I don't know. I just don't understand. I guess there's money involved in being possessed. 
That's the bottom line. Probably. I don't know. And I think people like that are why actual investigators and stuff don't like talking about doing the investigations and stuff like that because it gives everybody a bad name and yeah, it's just stupid <laughs> in my book. <laughs> I don't know. I think maybe I, I, I kind of go back and forth because I think maybe that is the energy at that place for them because if they're coming in super low vibration and they are kind of beaconing for those things, maybe that's exactly what they're getting. And so – Another medium has said that to me just this past week. So, yeah, that could be it. You go in there and you're at a lower vibration and you're you're expecting that. That's what you're going to get. Yeah, it's kind of like that one saying, you go looking for trouble, you're going to find it. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I do think that when we hear about uh, groups or investigations, now I don't believe all of them are getting possessed, but I think the ones that are having actual negative energy experiences – I think they may actually just be beacon. Like it doesn't matter where they could go to the waffle house and probably <laughs> beacon that in because that's what they're kind of, that's what they're right. open to. And that's what they're looking for. But for people such as yourself, you've learned to take accountability for your vibration and what you're looking mm -hmm. for. So you're not experiencing that. And that's, that's phenomenal. You're absolutely right. I mean, one of the guys I'm, I'm talking about that was on television, he's another medium and, Honestly, the the show just looks too comical. You know, the guy is like screaming and growling and he's like possessed and everyone's going to know exactly who I'm talking about here. And, I, you know, I'm not going to say his name, but if you look at his social media, the same guy has cameras all over his house and he claims that his house is haunted by demons and things like that. And like every day he's got a new story about, oh, my name was called last night and he'll play like a little video clip or whatever. And dude, you're drawing that energy to yourself. Of course you're haunted. <laughs> of course it's, you're haunted. It's your house. It's you. <laughs> I'll tell you, he could go to the waffle house if I like five different demons probably. So right. there's a demon in my waffles. <laughs> it's honestly, it's what he's beginning in is what it sounds like and what he's allowing in because vibrating out fear may draw some things in, but you still have, and I feel most people still have kind of like this natural barrier, but if you just let yourself be completely open, well, that barrier is not there anymore. So right. then you get the growling and the barking and the, <laughs> Demonic the waffles. Oh. What she didn't know is he's possessed by a Great Dane. <laughs> well, in his case, he's probably possessed by a cat. Yeah. <laughs> that go. works. Cats can be kind of mean. I love them, but they yes. can be mean. <laughs> yes. They will kiss. They'll ki do the little nose nuzzle and then slap you. Like that's exactly. <laughs> Like I love you, Scott. <laughs> Just kidding, whack. No, I mean it, it is fun to laugh at, at these people, though, and you know I'm sure he means well, and it's just yes. entertainment. But still, it's pretty comical. It sure but I, you know, I just want people to know that's not really what mediumship is about. You know, it, there's a whole lot more to it than getting possessed, and you're not going to get possessed when you go into a haunted building and all that kind of stuff. That's just ridiculous to me. But not unless you're whatever. saying I let you in. In which case, well, exactly. you did that to yourself. Yes. <laughs> All right. CL, where can people find more information about you and your amazing books and podcast? Um, I am on www.clthomas.org. It's pretty easy. That's my name. Everything there is is on there. Check out CL's podcast. CL has amazing guests on and great conversations. So if you want to hear more awesome topics and experiences, head on over to Small Town Podcast, right? Small Town That's Tells right. Podcast. Small Town Tells Podcast. I did start a new show. I got asked to do a radio show now. It's called The Gateway Podcast. Now, that one is a little less paranormal. It's more about um, spiritualism. So that's what we talk about. We talk about spirit communication and kind of the deeper topics that come along with, with it. I'm here for it. I'll be subscribing to that. <laughs> All right. Do we have any final thoughts before we close this amazing episode up? I don't, but if people want to ask me questions or anything, I'm pretty friendly. I'll, I'm more than happy to answer those questions for you. 
and you take amazing photographs. So oh, thank you. <laughs> follow CL's uh, open social media wherever. Or CL, where can people find your photographs? I should probably say it that oh, way. Oh, you know what? I kind of had taken it down because I'm kind of building a new gallery. Right oh, now. okay. It's going to be it's a similar gallery. Um, I was actually working on that today. I'm going to put up a whole lot of new stuff. I have a new show coming up called Ghosts. Sweet. And it's on the ghost towns that I've been working on. So... So Stay tuned for that. We'll do. <laughs> CL takes phenomenal photos, beautiful photos. Yes. <laughs> I swear Thank I'm like you. the one person, I, like Facebook boosts your algorithm for me. So like every time you post a photo, I see it and I'm like, love, love. Look, I'm the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know anybody saw that stuff. <laughs> oh, yes. Anytime they come up. And it's great. I love that it's not suppressed on my feed. <laughs> All right, John Thomas, you want to bring us home? All right. Thank you again, CL, for coming on. I hope we can have you on again soon rather than later. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. And thank you to all of our listeners for listening to this episode of Three Haunted Podcast with your host. I'm John Thomas. I am Ashley Lunar Goddess. And if you have any questions, comments, or episode suggestions, please feel free to email us at threehauntedpodcast at gmail.com. And if you haven't done so already, please like, follow, and subscribe to all of our social media. Again, you don't want to miss amazing guests like CL. Until next time.